Hey guys, um, so this is lesson two um, about aerodynamics. When I want to start talking about this lesson, I want to start basically uh, introduce the idea of what it means to understand aerodynamics and give a basic idea and understanding the principles um, for that. What I like to do is when I start about this, I like to talk about the, uh, the C5 Galaxy um, just because it's a beautiful aircraft. A beautiful aircraft that not only um, is a perfect example of you know aerodynamics at true work, but it's also a good understanding that aerodynamics works in small planes as well as large planes. So my dad was a C5 Galaxy pilot. What happened, um, he, was, he flew that for a very long time before he went and transitioned to uh, the airline for the job. But I was able to actually see some C5s take off and everything. And if you ever get the opportunity to watch a video of a C5 taking off or see it in real life, it's actually really cool because it's a huge aircraft. Um, it's a huge aircraft that you mean, it's barreling down the runway. You don't think it's going to take off. And then all of a sudden that nose starts coming up and the aircraft just jumps in the air. It's the coolest thing in the world to see. Um, but it really makes you start thinking about what aerodynamics is because without aerodynamics, this wouldn't be possible. Um, aerodynamics um, is simply just you know the basic study of understanding how airplanes fly and they operate. Um, so we're going to kind of dive into that. We're going to have four uh, fundamental forces acting on aircraft in flight. We have thrust, drag, lift, and weight. Okay, thrust <clears throat> it acts parallel to the longitudinal axis. Um, we're going to get into that in a few minutes. We're going to talk about the axes of the aircraft, but before that, we're going to just kind of you know go over some basic principles. So thrust it's going to act parallel to the longitudinal ax axis. Drag is a force that goes against thrust. Drag um, opposes thrust and acts uh, re rearward parallel to the relative wind. Okay. Um, lift and weight are in opposition to each other. We have lift, which acts perpendicular to the flight path and through the center of lift, um, perpendicular to the lateral, lateral axis. In level flight, lift opposes weight. Um, okay. And weight is just simply um, everything's got weight. Weight is the pull back towards the center of the earth. So. Uh, that pull is actually directly um, underneath what we call the center of gravity, which we're also going to talk about when we talk about moment and arm and getting a little bit of physics there. But again, those four forces are thrust, drag, lift, and weight. All right, we're going to take a little time and we're going to kind of dig a little deeper into what each of these mean um, and to understand them, okay? So first thing we're going to talk about um, is thrust. But to understand these guys, to understand the basic principles of it, um, thrust opposes drag, lift opposes weight. So to be an unaccelerated equal flight, all, opposite, all opposing forces have to be equal. That means weight has to equal lift, thrust has to equal drag. If you're in that situation, you're not going to climb, you're not going to descend, you're not going to speed up, and you're not going to decelerate. If any time those forces are unequal, um, you're going to have a change. You're going to have a change in either altitude and climbing and descending, or you're going to have a change in thrust and speed. Either I'm going to decelerate or I'm going to uh, accelerate. Um, so remember that if I have more thrust and less, and, and less drag, um, I'm going to uh, accelerate through the air. I'm going to go a little faster. But when all those forces are equal and they're um, they're in equilibrium, as we say in physics, um, you're not going to change any of the um, things like that. Okay, so thrust, guys. Um, in this situation, we want to think about what causes thrust in our aircraft. In our Skyhawks and our 172s and in our symbols, we have propellers that are pushing the aircraft forward. Um, we talked about that in the last flight. That the, as the propeller spins, um, it's creating that full that force force back, and we're actually in turn going forward. In aerodynamics part two, we're actually going to dig into propeller principles, so we're not going to talk about it too much. But for an aircraft that basically start moving, it's going to have to um, have thrust. Without thrust, the aircraft is just going to sit there stationary. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Now we're going to talk about lift for a second, kind of dive into that. Lift is pilot control. So also with thrust, there's two things in, that we can change really. Um, significantly in the aircraft. The first one's going to be uh, thrust, which we just talked about. Thrust we can directly change with the throttle. Um, changing that throttle is going to increase the power output of the aircraft. Um, with our engines, most of them are direct drive, which means that our engine components are directly um, connected to um, the the, uh, the propeller, pretty much, if you will. Um, there's some other linkage in there between there, but what the engine puts out is what the propeller is going to put out. So the more power we put into the engine, the more fast that, the, that propeller is going to spin, the more thrust we're going to receive from that. Okay, it also works in the opposite. I pull the throttle out, I'm going to produce less thrust. With lift, it's also pilot control as well. When I pull back on my yoke and I start climbing, um, I'm increasing my lift. I'm increasing the angle of attack. Um, when I push forward, I'm decreasing the angle of attack. It's pilot control. The inputs I put into the aircraft are the same inputs I'm going to get out of the aircraft when I'm you know, trying to do something. All right, so I'm going to introduce an equation here for lift. It's a basic lift equation. I'm going to write down this whiteboard. It might be a little hard to see, but I'll also talk about it some. So we have lift. Um, we're going to say that it's L, is equal to uh, the coefficient of lift times pressure times velocity squared and over the surface area, all divided by 2. I know it's a little hard to see, but that's it right there. So what this means, guys, simply stated, 
is lift is going to be equal to my coefficient of lift. My coefficient of lift, guys, is um, directly related to my angle of attack, my AOA, as we call it. Um, so this is going to be directly related to this. So center left and AOA are the same thing. We're going to talk about that in a second. Pressure, we really can't change. Velocity, we can change. Like I said, uh, thrust and velocity. Um, with the throttle, I'm going to change that. And then the surface area. We do have some control over surface area with flaps and everything. But for this discussion, we're going to say surface area is going to say the stand. All divided by 2. So right here, guys, we can see the uh, the impact that we have when we change our coefficient of lift here and our velocity here. So if I if I change my velocity, I'm also going to be changing um, my lift. So I increase my velocity, this lift uh, number is going to go up. If I increase my critical uh, coefficient of lift or my angle of attack, I'm also going to increase more lift. So we're going to talk about slow flight for a minute. We know that slow flight, we're at a high angle of attack, um, but we're at a slower velocity. So how does that work? Well, remember, since we're in um, slow flight, the uh, the aircraft isn't climbing or descending because we want to be maintaining that altitude for performance-wise. So if, that means my lift has to equal my weight, which means my lift isn't going to change. The, my output of lift isn't going to change at all. What's going to change is my coefficient of lift, my angle of attack, and my velocity. So if I'm going to increase, if I pull that velocity back, I pull the throttle back to configure my aircraft for slow flight, what's going to happen to my airspeed? My airspeed is going to start just uh, coming down, which means if this number is decreasing, that means my coefficient of lift is going to have to increase. My angle of attack is going to have to come up. So you can see it's a balancing act between my angle of attack and my thrust to maintain and keep the same amount of lift, okay? All right, so that's pretty much lift right there. Another thing I want to talk about real quick and have a basic understanding is angle of attack. We've thrown that word around a few times, and I want to make sure we're all on the same page with that. So with angle of attack, you got to think of cord line of the aircraft. So I'm going to draw a crude looking, a little bit of a wing here. There's my wing right here. You can kind of see that right here. I know it's very difficult to see with this lighting. Um, and we have what's called a cord line, which is the middle of the, the, the front of the wing to the trailing edge. Right here. We draw a little elongated. Then we have something called relative wind. Relative wind is just like it, is like it sounds. Relative wind is the wind hitting my uh, wing, pretty much. So we're going to say the relative wind's right here. That's my relative wind. So you can see right here, in between my relative wind and my cord line, my elongated cord line, I have what we call... It's an angle. It's an acute angle right here. That is actually our angle of attack. So you can see as our wing starts coming up higher, that angle of attack is going to start getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So as you can see, that as I pull back on the yoke, I'm going to increase my angle of attack. I'm going to increase my coefficient of lift, on um, therefore increasing lift in, um, uh, initially. Also, you can see that um, you know when we're talking about slow flight, as I start bringing that up, that's how my angle of attack, my critical or my coefficient of lift is changing. Okay, so that's pretty much lift right there. Um, now we're going to talk about, um, we talked about thrust, we talked about lift, the two forces we can control. Now we're going to talk about drag. Drag is something we really can't control too much as pilots. There is some we can do to, you know, um, combat it, but lift, uh, drag and uh, weight are always going to be there. So the first thing we're going to talk about is drag. There's two force types of drag. We have parasite and we have induced drag. First thing we want to talk about is we want to talk about parasite drag. Um, parasite drag um, it's something we really can't change. The manufacturers who design the aircraft are going to be able to change it, but unfortunately, as pilots um, and what we can do, we can't change parasite drag too much. So for parasite drag, there's three time, three ways we can break it down. We can break it down into form drag, we can break it into interference drag, and then skin friction. So let's go through those real quick. Form drag is going to be the aircraft. Um, I remember when I was a private student, Mr. Rogers, um, you guys, you guys, I know you guys who are watching this video know who that is. Mr. Rogers taught us, or told us that the Cessna 172 isn't an aerodynamically sound aircraft. It's like a brick with a propeller on the front of it. That's form drag in a nutshell right there. It's the shape of the aircraft. It's the profile of the aircraft flying through the uh, wind. We're not, you know, we're not fire jets. We're not flying a really fast and aerodynamically sound aircraft. Um, so form drag is what the aircraft looks like and when it's flying through the, the air. Interference drag is actually um, 90 degree angles caused by the uh, intersections of wings and fuselages. So if you look at our seminals, you go out and look at it, you have the nacelle or the engine cowling connected to the wing, you see these things called fairings. It's going to kind of smooth out that uh, 90 degree angle to produce less uh, interference drag. Interference drag is because you have two um, forces of wind coming into each other, they're forming what are called eddies, and that energy is actually going to start slowing the aircraft down and causing more drag and more interference, thus the word interference drag. Okay, and now the last one we're going to talk about is skin friction drag. You look at our 172s, you're going to notice that our 172s um, look really streamlined, they're nice, you feel it, you put your hand over them, it's like, it's slick. 
Not the case. So you take a, a microscope to it, you're actually going to see there's like little imperfections in the wing. Those imperfections are, act like sandpaper. You pour sandpaper or water down sandpaper, you're going to notice that the water kind of doesn't flow smoothly over it. Same thing with the wind. And there, it's going to have this little, hit those little imperfections, those little rivets in the wing and everything. And it's actually going to call something we call a skin friction drag. That skin friction drag, that interference drag, and, the, and all those um, can combine what we call parasite drag. So all those three come together and we get parasite drag. And like I said, there's one more. There's induced drag. Induced drag is a little tricky. Um, it's one thing you got to understand in aviation. Induced drag is actually can be a good thing. Understanding induced drag because when I understand induced drag, I'm starting to understand the energy of my aircraft. If I can properly control induced drag and I can understand when I'm putting out a lot of induced drag, I'm going to be able to send better. I'm going to be able to manage my energy better. That's one thing that really put in perspective for me when I was flying a Seminole, that induced drag is actually a friend and something you can use to make sure your aircraft flying at a steady and good approach into the uh, airplane or into the airport, excuse me. So basically with induced drag is induced drag is lift or is, is uh, the offspring, if you will, of lift. When I'm producing lift, I'm producing um, drag, induced drag. So induced drag is basically the offspring of lift. When I produce lift, I produce induced drag. Basically think about it like this. In a mechanical um, environment, you can, you can never have 100% efficiency. If you have 100% efficiency, you have a perfect uh, equipment, a perfect machine, which isn't physically possible. It's not physically possible because of the laws of mechanics. So think about it as a bouncy ball. I take a bouncy ball and I bounce it. It's not gonna, if I drop it from here, it's not gonna come back up to my hand. It's gonna be a little bit lower. Why is that? Because there's a loss of energy. There's a loss of um, you know, performance and mechanical energy there. Same thing with um, lift right there. That's a basic simple property in understanding induced drag. When I produce lift, I'm gonna be having a negative effect which we call induced drag. Those wingtip vortices, um, those eddies form from it, the energy caused in downwash is all gonna to equate to induced drag and what we actually get. So the more lift I produce, the more induced drag I produce. So think about this, like we have a, I'm looking at a chart here, um, it's like a drag curve chart and there's two types, we have parasite and we have induced drag. As my airspeed increases, my induced drag comes from here and it starts to slowly decrease. Because you know, as I am speeding up, I don't need to have that high angle of attack anymore. Thus, my lift um, isn't going to be as, uh, affected as much. Thus, meaning my induced drag is going to come down. However, my parasite is actually going to come up. As I start going faster, my interference drag starts going up, my skin friction drag starts going up, and all that stuff just starts equating to a higher parasite drag. So you can look at this total drag chart, and you can see actually how all your drag kind of computes with each other, and you can see you know, what airspeed is the best for um, least amount of drag. And at that point where you have the least amount of drag is actually where you're going to find your best glide speed and where you're going to have to understand, hey, if I lose an engine, I want to glide it here because I'm mean, good speed, less drag is a good uh, you know, attitude to be in when you're flying, okay? So that's kind of drag right there. Now we're going to talk about, um, we're going to touch into weight. Weight, basic property, is that gravity is going to pull us towards the center of the earth, okay? I'm going to do a kind of a little demonstration here with this eraser and this, uh, this pen real quick. So in the aircraft, we have what we call center of gravity. Center of gravity is a force. If I took this pen and I balanced my airplane on it, it would actually just sit there. It'd sit there fully. I wouldn't have to touch it. And it would balance on it. We've all balanced stuff on our fingers before, and we had noticed that we have to kind of move our fingers around based on where the weight is distributed, but we get a point basically where that'll just sit there freely. Center of gravity is the same thing. All right, another thing with center of gravity is center of gravity is that, that position where that weight is actually being pulled down to the center of the earth, okay? And that really doesn't change. So let's say my center of gravity is right here. It's all You can see my pen's pulling down to the ground. And as I start even, you know, if I get in a higher angle of attack, you see that pin's not changing. So as my plane's, you know, kind of pivoting around that center of gravity point, my weight vector is still going straight down to the ground. And that's where we start seeing basic principles uh, when we're seeing uh, vectors like weight, thrust, and drag all kind of starting to combine with each other. So you see as I'm climbing up, you know, my drag vector is going to be in opposition of my thrust. It's going to be parallel to my relative wind. You can see my, thr my drag, which would be down here, and my... Um, my gravity and my weight are actually starting to act together. That's why when we start climbing, you're gonna see you're gonna have reduced performance as you start getting higher because as I produce less power, my drag and my weight kind of start acting together in accordance to start kind of slowing me down and bring me down uh, back down to level. Same thing like this when I start tilting in, I have a uh, angle of attack pointing down. My thrust and my weight are starting to act in accordance with each other, giving me much when we accelerate going down. Um, down, you know, if you're in a car and you start accelerating down a hill, it's because my gravity and my um, inertia is pulling me actually, I'm going down that hill faster because my thrust and my weight vector are actually um, closer together and they're acting in accordance with each other. Um, 
Now we're going to kind of get a little bit of physics um, real quick when I want to touch on when we're talking about center of gravity. I'll probably touch on it again later. But in all of physics, you got to think about that seesaw in the, uh, the playground when you were kids. You know, you could have a big guy sitting here, and what happens if no one's on the other end? It's just going to sit like this, right? So you have to have somebody else balancing it out, right? So when we talk about longitudinal stability, I want you to start thinking about that seesaw effect, which we're going to touch on after we talk about a few more aerodynamic principles. Um, yeah, so remember that seesaw. It's really important when we start getting into that. So real quick, though, we're going to talk about uh, wingtip vortices. We touched on it on the section before this, but I want to kind of get a little deeper to it. So wingtip vortices um, is basically, you know how we have that high pressure to the low pressure? So here we're looking at the wing right here. We have a low pressure and a high pressure. This high pressure, as it wants to come over the top of the wing, actually causes a looping effect and a spiraling effect that comes down and cr down from the aircraft. Why is it important to understand wingtip vortices? Very simple, because wingtip vortices are like wake turbulence. And wake turbulence is extremely important for us to understand as pilots, especially when we're operating on a 172. A 172 isn't a big aircraft. Um, it's not. You know, when we follow behind those big jets, we are at risk of wake turbulence, which we're going to talk to in a minute. But to understand that, we need to understand uh, wingtip vortices, which are created because of the pressure differences from high to low, and it's causing a spiraling effect, which is one of the leading factors in induced drag because the energy required to create them is going to have a negative effect on um, our thrust, which is going to have the positive effect, if you will, for our drag. Our drag is going to go up. So wing, um, that's wingtip vortices. Wake turbulence. Okay. What is wake turbulence? Simply stated and simply understanding it, think of it like a boat. Okay, if I have a boat that's going through the water, it creates waves. Those waves are directly related to how the aircraft is situated in the water. If my bow is deep in the water, I'm going to have a bigger wake. If I'm clean and I'm hydroplaning, I'm going fast, I'm not going to have as big as a wake. Same principles work with uh, aviation. You know, if we have a plane that's set up for flight, are set up for landing, which means you might have some drag devices down, there might be a slow airspeed, um, they're going to create a lot of wake turbulence. Why is wake turbulence dangerous? Because if you fly into it as a pilot, it can actually disrupt your uh, attitude of flight, it can change your relative wind very quickly, and actually can put you in an attitude, in a position of flight that's almost non-recoverable. There's stories and stories of people who have flown into wake turbulence and had, had issues with it and not been able to recover. So wake turbulence avoidance is extremely important. That's when we talk about it early on in these lessons, because if not, um, students will have to st will struggle with understanding them. So the basic rule of reminder is if the aircraft's fat, clean, and slow, don't go below. Um, basically meaning if I am, um, I'll draw it out for you. So here's our runway. I know it's hard to see, but it's like right here. Here's my aircraft right here. It's Let's say it's a Citation or a CRJ right here. And I'm up here in my little Skyhawk. Okay? I know it's kind of hard to see, but as we're starting to fly, as this jet's flying down, as it's flying down, he's creating all this wake turbulence down here. All this wake turbulence, and I'm up here. So how, what would I do to avoid that? Well, I want to make sure my approach path is higher than that CRJ, so I stay out of his wake turbulence. So if I'm going to land in, behind a jet, I want to make sure I land beyond his touchdown point. So those jets always aim for the footers. They always aim for the 1,000 foot markers because it's a good um, idea of how much landing distance they have beyond them to stop. Um, so if they're aiming for the footers or the thousand footers, I want to make sure I land beyond them to stay clear of that wake turbulence. Wake turbulence can't stay around the air, uh, airport. It depends on what the wind's doing, which is very important in taking off. There's wake turbulence when you're taking off from an aircraft because remember they've got sometimes they have drag devices out to increase lift. Um, they're sometimes slower, so you got to make sure when they're taking off. When if they're taking off here, I take off and I rotate prior to their rotation, and then I sidestep the runway in accordance with the wind because the wind's going to push those wingtip vortices away from the runway. So if I step into the side, step into the wind, rotate before them, I'm going to miss my wake turbulence. I'm not going to hit it, which is where we want to be in aviation. We want to be thinking about, hey, this plane just took off in front of me. What, what, what's going on with that air? Where are those waves, if you will? Um, how do I avoid that to make sure I have a safe and clean and good takeoff roll and there's no issues? So start thinking about that as a pilot so we understand this is a safety thing. It's also another thing. Um, it's going to make my ride smoother for my passengers behind me. Hitting weight turbulence is not fun. It's not safe, and it can put you in a situation where you can um, cause harm to yourself and the aircraft you're flying in. Okay, another thing we want to talk about um, with aviation is ground effect. What is ground effect? Well, when you start flying, you're going to start noticing this feeling of when I enter this, um, when I get about wingtip's length. So from wingtip to wingtip, if I turn that horizontally or vertically, excuse me, and put it down to the ground, about that distance from the ground, I'm going to I started feeling this effect we call ground effect. What is ground effect? It was basically the feeling that the aircraft does not want to land. 
it's when we start getting down to this point, and you know we have those wingtip vortices so that sometimes affect drag and everything, and increase induced drag. And we have downwash. All those principles go away because we're so close to the ground. It's like this ballooning effect, this pillow effect, that when we get close to the ground, the aircraft doesn't want to land. The danger in this is that when we start getting closer to, um, you know, flaring and stuff, and we're starting to flare too long, or floating as we, as we call it. Um, you can actually float off the end of the runway if you're not careful. There's stories and stories of people who have entered ground effect too fast and they just hug in ground effect. They stay and they stay and they stay and they can't get the wheels down because of ground effect and they end up floating or running off the end of the runway. So how do we manage that? we got to make sure our speed is managed, our energy is managed when we enter ground effect and we expect it. The problem is people sometimes don't expect ground effect to have that much of an effect on the aircraft, but it actually does. When you start flying, you'll feel it. as soon as you get low, all those drag, all that stuff just goes away and you're basically flying in a higher efficiency um, form of flying right there so you got you know you're creating the same amount of lift but you have less induced drag so higher efficiency means I'm gonna want this aircraft because I want to fly it's gonna want to float it's gonna want to float and it can put you in a situation where you will run off the end of the runway which is extremely dangerous um, especially um, in our 172s who aren't very forgiving with stuff like that okay so now I spoke about it earlier we're gonna talk about axes of an aircraft why is it under important to understand axes of an aircraft because our plane rotates and pivots around axes. There's three of them, okay? They're pretty simple to understand. Um, they kind of make sense. All right, first thing we want to talk about is pitching. So here's my aircraft. Let's say this is the front and this is the back. Pitching is what we, that, that we call when we go up or we go down. It's the pitching. So if we were going to put a bar through this so we can only pitch one direction, it'd go across it like this, lateral axis. Ladder, I remember it by ladder because if I point this up like this, climbing the ladders to get higher. Pitching means getting higher, I climb a ladder to get higher. Pitching lateral axis, okay? And then we have what we call a rolling uh, moment, or a rolling action, which is produced by our ailerons, the deflection, um, and it's gonna be this way. So if I put a bar through the middle of it, through the longitudinal axis, remember long, um, that means that I'm going to have that rolling moment. Okay, the last one is yawing. Yawing is uh, uh, per performed with our rudder usage. You can feel the aircraft, if I kick my right rudder, my aircraft's gonna pull over to my right. If I kick my left, it's gonna come over here. So I'm rotating like this. My aircraft is rotating like this. That means it's a vertical axis component. It means it goes straight down from my wings, through my seat, down through my wheels. Vertical axis, it's super easy to remember because um, it's vertical, okay? So why is it important to understand um, axes of an aircraft? Basically for stability reasons. If we can understand how our aircraft moves and how the longitudinal the lateral axis and the yawing moments, we can understand the stability of the aircraft, okay? So now we're gonna get into uh, moment and arm. We were talking about physics earlier, we were talking about how you had that seesawing effect. So if you think of the example, like we have a normal seesaw, the, the pivot point's right in the middle. If we have equal weight, we're just gonna sit there. But if I move that pivot point back, forward, or aft more, that means my weight's gonna have more effect on the other side. So the closer my pivot point is to the weight, um, you know, it's gonna change the effect. So if I have a greater arm length between my pivot point and where the force is applied, the force on the other side is going to be greater. That's just a basic physics and understanding principle property. So that when we think about our aircraft, we think about, you know, we have our tail, which is a little bit farther back. We have our center of lift or our wings um, right above us. So you can see that we have that creation of that, um, that seesaw with a different uh, fulcrum or a, a pivot point a little higher, a little farther back. That pivot point is actually our center of gravity. So that's why it's important to understand that. Actually, our, yeah, our pivot point is actually going to be our center lift, excuse me. Our center of gravity is like the weight on the other side. Sorry for the uh, confusion. So that's important to understand where that can be because um, understanding where your center of gravity and where your center of lift is is going to understand and basically explain what kind of stability you have in the aircraft. Um, a study of physics shows that a body is free to rotate and will always rotate around its center of gravity. Our, uh, our axes all go through the center of gravity. Our plane rotates, pivots, and rolls all around that center of gravity. Okay, so when pilots, when manufacturers are creating aircraft, they're actually creating aircraft for specific tendencies and for specific uh, jobs. The 172s we fly in were built for as training aircraft. The uh, C-17s and the C-5s were not built to be training aircraft. They were built to be heavy cargo air carriers and to be able to fly long places and take a lot of equipment. Our Skyhawks aren't designed for that. Our Skyhawks are designed for training purposes. So people, when they design aircraft, they look at all these stability things, they look at the axes and all that, and they can actually put up together an airplane for a specific purpose. And that's why it's kind of important to understand this stuff. Okay, so I've been throwing around that word stability for a while. What is stability, okay? 
Stability is the inherent quality of an aircraft to correct from a condition um, that may disrupt it. So I've bumped my aircraft one way. My stability is going to be directly related to how my aircraft reacts to that bumping. Okay? So there's two types. There's static stability and there's dynamic stability. Static stability is the initial tendency of the aircraft to correct for it. What is it going to do? Is it going to want to come back? Is it going to sit there? Or is it going to get worse? So if we think about this in terms of I'm flying my, my 172 here or my Magic Eraser, if you will. All right? So static positive stability is like the example we put. Um, if you put a if you take a ball in a bowl and you just disrupt it a little bit, that ball is gonna and it's gonna kill, it's gonna move around, but it's gonna come back to rest in the original position. That's positive static stability. So positive static stability is like I'm flying straight and level here. A wind hits me like this. Yeah, I kind of you know my initial thing in my air, my angle of attack goes up five degrees. My initial tendency, if I have positive static stability, is it's gonna initially come back down. Okay. Neutral stability is if I have a plate, a, 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 a flat plate, and I have a ball on it, and I push that ball, that ball is just going to kind of keep rolling and eventually just going to stop. It's not going to move anymore. So static, uh, neutral static stability is if that same thing happens, a little wind hits me up, hits me, and my nose comes about 5 degrees, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to go down, it's not going to go up, but it's going to sit there. Neutral st uh, static stability. You see this in a lot of like acrobatic aircraft. Now negative is a little different. Negative is if I took that bowl I used in the first example and I flipped it upside down and I put that ball on top and I pushed it, it's going to roll off the end of that uh, bowl, right? Same idea. So if that wind comes and hits me up five degrees and goes up, instead of sitting here or going back to normal, it's going to get worse. It's going to keep um, pitching up until, you know, eventually you have to do something as a pilot to correct for it. That's negative static stability, okay? Now, dynamic stability... I wish my marker was working out. I feel bad that it just went out, so I'm gonna have to try to explain this without drawing. It's easier to explain if I draw it. Um, it's something I would definitely do when I, you know, I'm talking to my students. But we have three again. We have positive, we have neutral, and we have negative. So think about this in oscillation terms. So oscillation means how my wavelengths of um, change. So if I go five degrees nose up, um, and then I, how is my plane gonna react? Is it gonna kind of come back to normal? Is it gonna stay in that oscillation pattern, or is it gonna get worse and just keep going? So dynamic stability is the aircraft's response over time to change. So again, we have that tendency for the first one. The nose goes up about 5 degrees. With positive dynamic stability, my nose is going to go up 5 degrees, and it's going to go about 3 degrees down, uh, 2 degrees up, 1 degree down, and then it's going to be back to level flight. So you can see that pattern. It goes up, and it starts getting better. It comes back to about, about normal. Neutral is like the similar one we talked about. Um, it doesn't get worse. It doesn't get better, though. So if I make that initial hit and it goes up, my oscillation is just going to stay the same until the pilot does something. So I'm going to keep going 5 degrees nose up, 5 degrees nose down, 5 degrees nose up, 5 degrees nose down, until as a pilot I correct for it. Neutral dynamic stability is just like, or excuse me, negative is a negative, it's very bad. So if I hit that, it comes up 5 degrees nose up, I'll then go 7 degrees nose down, 8 degrees nose up, 10 degrees nose down, and it's going to keep kind of oscillate out of control. So manufacturers think about it and like okay if we have an acrobatic plane we want neutral static and dynamic stability because when I put that in input in I want the plane to sit there and training we want positive all around because if I upset the aircraft I want that plane to come back to its normal position so I have a better and safe training environment it's easier to work in okay you get negative stabilities and stuff like that when you're talking about like fighter pilots people who want to crank and bank and really just maneuver the aircraft okay so stability has two effects on maneuverability and controllability all right um, now we're going to talk about some more areas of uh, stability. We're going to talk about longitudinal stability. So when we talk about longitudinal stability, I don't want you to get confused with longitudinal stability is the same as longitudinal axis. Actually, it's quite the op opposite. Longitudinal stability is actually going to talk about the pitching of the aircraft, the quality that makes the aircraft stable around its lateral axis. So longitudinal stability equates to um, lateral axis um, stability, if that makes sense. I know it's confusing. Um, it's all dependent on the location of the wing with respect to the center of gravity. Okay, so once you think of this, we have our, let's go back to our classic uh, example of the seesaw, and we'll put our fulcrum or our center of lift um, right here. Now, if we put a pressure here in the very front, my uh, seesaw is just going to go up like this and it's just going to sit here. So how come in our plane, since our center of gravity is ahead of our center of lift, we're not flying around at this attitude all the time? because our tail, our tail adds that downward force, that other force down here to kind of balance us back out. Because we have that tail adding that downward force right there, um, it's actually going to balance the fulcrum. It's going to balance the seesaw. Um, that's longitudinal stability, okay? Now we're going to go to lateral stability, rolling stability. So 
what happens when I get upset like this? Is my plane just going to stay here? Is it going to kind of bounce back? For this, I want to think about a boat for a, bit, a minute, okay? With lateral stability, um, the biggest one um, is going to be what we call the keel effect, okay? So in a boat, when a wave hits a boat, what does it do? It doesn't just sit over there on its side, right? It come, It rocks back and forth, right? So because of our wings and how they act and how they, one produces more lift and less lift, it's actually going to cause that same rolling and that bouncing back effect known as the keel effect. That's where we start seeing our lateral stability um, because of the keel effect. Big, big things uh, equated to that are going to be what type of wing design. Am I going to have swept back? Am I going to have uh, forward swept wings? Am I going to have normal wings? Um, stuff like that. Um, weight distribution is also extremely important to that. All right, and the last one um, is directional stability, yawing. So if I, uh, you know, something hits me this way, is my plane just going to sit there in that direction or is it going to come back to the normal attitude I was before? In our Skyhawks and our 172s, you'll notice that I kick the left rudder and let go, I come right back. That's called weather veining. Um, if you think about it, if I turn this way and I have my tail sticking out here, it's a bigger area for um, that wind to strike. So that wind's going to strike that and it's actually going to push me back um, to normal attitude. That's why we have such good directional stability in our Skyhawks. So next time you go flying in, I want you to kick those rudders and kind of play with them and you'll realize I kick that right rudder, I turn over to my right, I'm gonna, as soon as I come off it, I'm going to come right back to it. That's because of a simple thing that we call uh, weather veining. All right? So um, last thing I want to talk about real quick um, is the effect of wing plan form. So what is a wing um, and why are they designed in specific ways? Simply stated, like I said before, manufacturers can take an aircraft and they can make it for a specific purpose. Same thing with wings. In our Skyhawks and our 172s, we have we are a rectangular wing. Why do we have that? Why don't we have like an elliptical wing or a swept back wing if we don't want if we want that? You know what's the difference? Each wing has a specific purpose in mind for it, right? So my rectangular wing has great stalling characteristics, which is great for a training environment. You know, a rectangular wing, I'm going to stall from the wing root, which means that my ailerons are going to be more effective um, the longer I'm going to stall. If our stall started at the wing tip where my ailerons are, how am I going to correct for it? How am I going to correct for roll um, in a stall? I can't. So in a rectangular wing, we get those great stall characteristics. We have that great performance. That's why rectangular wings are for great training aircraft. That's why our 172s have it. So each wing has a specific um, design for it. You see like our fighter jets, they have those swept back wings for high speed flight and maneuverability. Um, so that's why if you start thinking, when you like start flying different aircraft, look at the type of wings it has and that should directly tell you, you should be able to understand, hey, this has got a rectangular wing. I know this is a great training aircraft. It's got great stall characteristics. I could go do stalls all day in this, and I'm going to be great. I'm going to learn a lot. Um, you see step back wings, you're going to see, oh, maybe this is for you know a faster aircraft. I'm going to have some high speed and good maneuverability for it. Okay? So I ran through that really quickly uh, on purpose. One, because I want to make sure I get this video um, in the time required. Two, um, there's a lot of important information that I would definitely like to like talk about more. But that's where the student comes in. Students need to look at these the stuff I've taught about and they need to dig a little deeper in the P-Hack and understand it because when they understand it and then I can teach it, we have more of what we call a conversation instead of me just spitting out knowledge and you trying to pick it up on it. Um, so for this, I'd, you know, I'd ask a couple of questions. I'd ask, you know, what are the four forces of flight, the two types of drag, parasite drag, why is CG important, how do I avoid weight turbulence, stuff like that, just to make sure the student understood what I talked about. And then I end with, you know, a thing of encouragement, like just keep thinking about the C-5. You know, how cool is it such a big aircraft with a 222-foot wingspan can take off um, at an airport? You know, they have short field capabilities. Why is that? What is it? Aerodynamics is the answer to that. You know, I know aerodynamics is a simple answer, but it actually opens up a universe full of scientific theories and ideas that are actually fun to understand. And when you understand aerodynamics, it actually makes you a better and a safer pilot because you understand what you're flying in. You understand the environment. It makes you uh, visualize what the dangers could be out there, the dangers like wake turbulence. Um, if I'm going to hit wake turbulence, how am I going to avoid that? Anytime we can start putting ourselves ahead of the aircraft we're about to go flying, we're already at an advantage um, because we're going to be ready for when things happen. Anytime we start flying behind the aircraft is when things start snowballing and it starts getting a little dangerous. So the study of aerodynamics is actually a preventive maintenance, if you will, um, to understanding safety in an air airplane and understanding how to be a good pilot. Um, so that's my aerodynamics part one. Uh, next lesson, we're going to start talking about aerodynamics part two. We're going to really break down some more propeller principles um, and principles of flight and uh, turning tendencies and that that we didn't cover in this lesson.